2022 earnings conference call of Peri Light Industries Limited, hosted by Motilal Oswal Financial Services Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Krishnan Sambhamurthy, Lead Consumer Analyst, Motila Loswal Institutional Equities. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, Rutuja. On behalf of Motila Loswal Institutional Equities, I welcome you all to the 4Q and full year FI22 post results con call with the Pedalite Industries Management. We have with us Mr. Bharat Puri. Managing Director and Mr. Sunil Burde, Vice President Accounts. Over to Mr. Burde for opening comments. After which we will take the Q&A. Good evening, everyone. The current year registered a robust sales growth aided by strong volume growth across categories and geographies. Growth was broad based across consumer and bazaar and business to business segments, with both segments reporting volume growth of over 20% each. This was strongly enabled by the focus on digital initiatives, innovation, and building a resilient and agile supply chain. The current quarter witnessed price-led growth, with volumes remain subdued on account of pandemic and persistent inflation impacting consumer demand over previous year higher base. 45% growth in the same quarter last year. The margins remain impacted adversely by unprecedented inflation in key raw materials as a result of volatility and increase in input cost. This was particularly mitigated by calibrated pricing actions. In this difficult macro environment, we continue to make adequate investments in our brands. Now, I will begin with a summary of the financial performance for the year and quarter ended 31st March 22. On a consolidated basis, net sales at 9,880 crores for the year grew by 36.3%, with growth in CNB by 34.2% and B2B by 44.6%. Net sales for the quarter stood at 2,498 crores and grew by 12%. Material cost as a percentage to net sales for the year is higher by 853 basis points over the previous year and for the quarter is higher by 738 basis points over the same quarter last year. Due to the increase in price of key raw materials in the gross margin continue to get adversely impacted. We are continuously monitoring the input cost and necessary pricing actions, if any, will be taken. EBITDA before non-operating income for the year is at 1,869 crores, grew by 11.1% over the previous year. Profit before tax and exceptional items at Rs. 1,614 crores, grew by 5.7% over the previous year. PBT for the current quarter stood at Rs. 346 crores and declined by 16.6% over the same period last year. Now, moving to the standalone financial performance, net sales for the current year is at 8,298 crores, grew by 34.1% over previous year, with underlying sales volume and mixed growth of 19.9%. This was driven by 20.2% growth in sales volume and mix of both CNB and B2B each. Domestic CNB grew by 20.9% in volume. Next sales for the current quarter stood at 2,075 crores and grew by 12.1% over the same period last year. The prices of our key raw materials, VAM, have continued to increase during the quarter. Current procurements around $2,500 per metric ton. Q4-22 VAM consumption rates were at 2,420 dollars per metric ton versus Q4 21 of 1,180 dollars per metric ton. And compared to Q3 22, it was 1,968 dollars uh, per metric ton. Gross margin impacted on account of inflation in input costs resulting in all-time high prices for most of the principal raw materials. Material cost as a percentage to net sales is higher by 960 basis points over previous year and for the quarter is higher by 922 basis points over the same quarter last year. EBITDA before non-operating income for the year is at 1,612 crores, grew by 4% over the previous year. Profit before tax and exceptional items at Rs. 1,627, grew by 11.7% over the previous year. 
profit before tax for the current year stood at 397 crores and grew by 5.6% of the same period last year on a like to like basis excluding dividend from subsidiary profit before tax declined by 1.5% for the year and 20% for the current quarter about our subsidiary performance the subsidies in asia continued the growth momentum americas declined on a higher previous year base during the previous year sales were higher on account of pent up demand as well as benefits passed by the governments to consumers during covid margins continued to remain under pressure due to higher input cost domestic subsidies in cnb reported good sales growth performance of domestic subsidies in b2b are showing signs of revival on account of recovery in real estate and construction related activities during the year the company had filed two merger applications with the national company law tribunal with respect to the merger of its wholly owned subsidies namely pedilite adhesives private limited and cp polyurethanes private limited consequent to the filing of the nclt orders approving the merger with the rest of companies mergers have become effective from appointed date of first april 2022 as a result of merger being an event happening after balance sheet date no effect of merger given in the financial results while there are near term concerns around significant inflation and the impact of this on market growth we are confident of the medium to long term prospects of the home improvement sector and will remain focused on delivering consistent and profitable volume led growth thank you thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on the touch tone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and 2 participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question ladies and gentlemen we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles The first question is from the line of Avnish Roy from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, sir. My first question is the uh, competitive intensity in adhesives from regional players. Uh, could you talk about in the last one year? Uh, have you seen uh, any big change there? And uh, you have been extremely aggressive on M&A in the last uh, many years. So does this open up uh, more? Uh, inorganic opportunities in india uh, in the regional uh, space uh, do, you, do you think you can acquire some players that is there good uh, valuation uh, opportunity or uh, mostly you have already covered up uh, most of the white spaces thanks abhish uh, relevant question see the competitive intensity frankly over the last uh, 12 to 24 months Uh, has actually been lesser than normal largely because of two reasons i think a large number of regional players have suffered as a result of their supply chains being impacted as well as you know the impact of this whole input cost uh, inflation on them on competitive intensity we have new competitors coming in frankly every quarter there is you know somebody getting revived or a new competitor coming in given our shares and uh, position in the market obviously if you were a consultant you would tell fellows that you know even if you get 10% of this market it's a very attractive proposition so we've had a fair amount of people entering but from an intensity point of view the large amount of competition tends to be at what i call the discount end of the market where you know based on high dealer discounts high contractor allurements uh, lower pricing to the trade is really where a lot of the action has been uh, as far as mna is concerned when we find the right players who frankly have a brand or a route to market or a, it's then we will look at them but obviously you know uh, th- that will be opportunity dependent sure one follow up on this uh, uh, globally every rm has been extremely inflationary for you also vam has uh, doubled in the last one year uh, could you discuss uh, in the last few months what is the reason it is the 
सेम ओल्ड इश्यू ऑफ कंटेनर शॉर्टेज और जियो पोलिटिकल तो इफ द जियो पोलिटिकल इश्यू गेट रिजॉल्व यू सी ए बिग क्रैश कमिंग गिवन इन चाइना देर इज सच ए बिग स्लो डाउन यू सी दैट हैपनिंग एट सम स्टेज आई एम नॉट आस्किंग वेन आई एम आस्किंग विल विल दैट हैपन गिवन द सप्लाई डिमांड सिनेरियो See, given the supply demand scenario currently frankly a large number of these shortages are happening because of force majeures where you know plants are all i mean it, from the outside and obviously i cannot say definitively but there definitely seems to exist almost some cartelization where you know plants seem to coordinate their closing so that the amount of stock that is available in the global market remains almost constant having said that you are right that uh, if plants were to operate normally and china was to remain uh, remain depressed you will have suddenly an excess of supply over demand but we don't know when that will happen sure and uh, uh, what's the last question on the demand side uh, so in q4 uh, there was one month obviously of the omicron impact so uh, was that substantial in any of your uh, uh, demand uh, uh, industry segment and similarly uh, in terms of fy23 uh, do you think real estate which has done really well in last one year uh, wherein you supply lot of products to the real estate players do you see uh, a, a slowdown coming at some stage given interest rate high uh, real estate prices are again going up in the last one year have you started picking up some signs on uh, impending slowdown there be coming to the first as far as demand is concerned abhish uh you know you, you've had a lot of local stoppages as a result of you know january had omicron and you had some amount of uh supply uh, stoppages you had lot of uh, shop closures some of it extended to february but if i look at a longer period of time frankly largely demand has still been good there is a some amount of slowdown and now i am you know i am purposely looking at a longer period even if i look at post diwali right till today overall demand is still good there is some amount of strain in rural and semi urban india inflation is a massive you know tax that any uh, emerging economy and you know common consumer pays having said that we are hopeful that you know if you have a good monsoon the government actually does spend what it is projected to spend in the budget and front load some of it you will have a lot more money coming into the economy in the second half and therefore into people's hands so i think demand we you i would as you use use my usual phrase of being cautiously optimistic on the uh, input cost very difficult to say because you know geopolitics has definitely impacted it you can see the price of crude oil so on so forth and right now it's not clear as to where is the light at the end of the tunnel and when it will burst sir and one last follow up uh, bharat sir uh, uh you know the fmc veteran so fmc companies are uh, ramping up on bridge pack because 5 rupees in rupees is a big challenge uh, in your case also 5 rupee has been extremely strong uh, product and uh, it's a great draw uh, for the consumer but are you also thinking of bridge packs in in the 5 rupee 10 rupee 20 rupee in in the, in that range any bridge pack you are uh, uh, coming out uh, aggressively See, we have been very conservative, and in you know, actually, it's almost an oxymoron. Abhish, we've been conservative and aggressive. We actually haven't moved any. I mean, you know, having been a, one of the pioneers of the five rupee price point in chocolates, uh, I must tell you that on things like Fevi Quick and so on and so forth, we have not moved our price point now for 15 years, and even in this inflationary situation, we have not moved the price point. so frankly we don't see the need for bridge packs for two reasons one is obviously we already straddle the price points that we want to the second point is you know in items of mass consumption where there is down trading you would obviously need bridge packs in our case you know most of our consumers tend to be middle class and above and therefore you know when you are doing a house your smallest you don't need a bridge there are very little minor jobs that you do your your smallest pack tends to be at least a 5 kilo pack right okay sir that's very useful thanks a lot thank you thank you the next question is from the line of tejas shah from spark capital please go ahead yeah uh, hi sir thanks for the opportunity 
Uh, sir, if we look at uh, the growth and margin pressure from the lens of uh, poor pioneer and growth categories or the way we go. With a question, the line is unmuted. Hello, am I audible? Hello. 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 Mr. Tejasha, can you hear us? Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yeah, so, sorry for this. Uh, so, sir, if we uh, look at uh, growth and margin pressure uh, from the lens of core pioneer and growth categories, the way you uh, divide the portfolio, segregate the portfolio, are there any divergent trends on growth and uh, margin pressure? Actually, the largest margin pressure, I mean, and it's a coincidence, I don't think it is anything that is part of a trend, is actually on the core category. The growth and pioneer tend to have, a, have at least in the last 12 months, while there's been pressure, A, there is pressure across the portfolio, but the highest, portfolio, uh, the highest pressure has been on the core portfolio, little less on the growth and pioneer. Okay. Uh, now, sir, in, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that uh, there is a, this is an unprecedented uh, uh, inflationary scenario, and then the closest reference that we can make is somewhere around 2009-10, uh, when we had taken very uh, slightly late but aggressive price hikes uh, over a period of time, and when the uh, when the crude correction happened later on, we actually retained a lot of uh, that price hike in our in our PNL. Uh, hypothetically, if if that scenario has to play out in FY23. Uh, do you think that competitive pressure, uh, as it as as it stands today, will allow you to retain a lot of this price hikes that you have already taken, or will or you will take going ahead in coming quarters? See, what will happen, Tejas, is why we always indicate a margin range is largely because of that. If the situation turns benign post our having taken the price increases, obviously. We will give back a large part of it to the consumer, but we will then obviously end up at the top end of our margin range, is what my presumption is. Okay. So, sir, even in the interim, you won't uh, allow margins to cross that upper range that you have given for long term? See, they may cross, cross for one or two quarters, but, you know, we would prioritize growth in our experience. stages has been that if you take margins a little too high, you open the back doors and a lot more competitors start pulling at the uh, carpet before you realize it and then you're slipping. So we like to make sure that our price premiums and pricing remain, you know, focused on growing volumes rather than in the short run growing margins. Fair point, sir. Sir, and any typics uh, guidance for this year and next year? See, as far as CapEx is concerned, I must tell you, you know, one of the things, and I have spoken about this earlier, we were very clear that use this period to build the next generation supply chain. So I must tell you that over the last two years, we have expanded or put in 10 new facilities. And in addition to these 10 facilities, we have 12 facilities currently under construction, all of which will be completed in the next 12 months. So we will be, frankly, ready for the next phase of next three to four years of growth, we will be completely ready from a capacity perspective. Our CapEx still remains at the traditional three to five percent of sales. That's not going to go up. But because our sales has gone up, obviously now our number of in, uh, the amount of investment we are making in the supply chain, be it new facilities, be it new warehouses, separately the investment we are making in digital, for example, we would regard ourselves as one of the companies with the leading edge of dig digital as far as both consumers and dealers are concerned. I mean, today we are now getting almost 20% of our deal uh, dealer orders via Genie app where dealers don't actually know salesman, no distributor comes in. It is all done via an app. The same thing is getting extended to contractors. So there's a massive amount of investment in an agile and resilient supply chain there's a massive investment in the whole digital piece which is we've in a sense learned during covid and we don't want to use innovation has traditionally been a strength area of pidlite this has been an area where in the last two years obviously we were focusing on the core because of the situation on ground in the next 12 to 18 months you will practically from each of my divisions see one new product every quarter so the innovation machine is also ready to fire. So 
I mean, you know, while in the short run, yes, the inflation situation, the input cost situation is something of concern. Frankly, we are long-term players and we are quite, you know, uh, confident about not just the long but the medium-term prospects of the whole home improvement sector and we are ready for the next phase of growth. Very, very detailed answer. Sir. Thanks a lot and, and all the best, sir. Thank you, Pajan. Thank you. Participants who wishes to ask a question may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Anirudh Joshi from ICIC Security. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so just uh, uh, one question. Basically, how are uh, our market shares have moved in uh, waterproofing in uh, uh, past uh, uh, one year and three years? And also, if you can indicate uh, any market share trends, even if it's indicative, in the four regions, West, East, uh, North and South. Yeah, thanks. Okay, as far as waterproofing is concerned, Aniru, it has been one of our strong drivers of growth. And not just this year or last year, but for the, you know, therefore the, over the last, I would say, 12, uh, 24 to 36 months. Given our growth rates, it's, I would say, the market is consolidating. The number of uh, players in the market is becoming, you know, a lot of the small and medium sector is suffering and the larger fellows are getting larger i would suspect as you know we would have gained some market share or you know the market would have grown aggressively and therefore our market share would be constant but it is you know it's a market that in our view what is most important is the market grows faster rather than you know uh, you take share from others because obviously the largest single opportunity is winning against non consumption you know, given that pretty much six out of ten consumers in India don't do any proper waterproofing. So that's the overall situation as far as waterproofing is concerned. On overall pedalite, also, if you look at our growth rate, so on and so forth, our belief again is in our core categories, be it white glues, be it very quick, we have gained some share largely because in you know times when uh, times are difficult, both from a inflation and input cost point of view as well as a supply point of view the leaders tend to gain and consumers tend to gravitate towards brands that they trust but it, it would not be a substantial movement but there will be a steady increase in market share there is no substantial uh, difference that we find in our performance across regions which tends to show that you know we could have uh, gained more in some area or so on and so forth. Our performance is largely secular. You know, one state, one year may have some issues, etc. But on a, if I look at a two, three year basis, we are moving steadily. The ship is moving steadily forward pretty much across the board. Okay, okay. Sure, sir. Uh, no, because uh, multiple paint companies uh, have been gaining market share. So, but uh, I mean, so again, uh, I believe that they are gaining market share again from the smaller stroke uh, un unorganized sector itself. See, plus remember that most of the big companies participate in the what I call the renovation and the repair segment. A lot of them don't participate in the new construction segment because there the whole channel tends to be different. Plus, paint companies tend to, you know, add their exterior paint sales to waterproofing to show a greater waterproofing number. I mean, in our books, in that is actually the exterior paint, which may perform some amount of uh, protective function. So, if you add exterior paints, etc., then the paint company figures look nice. But they have had exterior paints for 25 years, and earlier it was never called waterproofing. Oh, okay, okay, okay. No, no, sir. Understood. This is. Uh... Fairly clear, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Telok from Diamond Asia. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sorry for the you know background, but you know I just want to check on uh, the volume growth we consume in the last business. Although we understand it from high base. Uh, what sort of trends are you know, seeing, and uh, are, I mean, are, are you going to, uh, you know, oh, 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 o
the next question is from the line of Mr. Krishnan Sambamurthy from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi Bharat, hi Sunil. Uh, Bharat, uh, from a technology perspective, uh, uh, what have been the efforts in reducing the pipeline inventory uh, over the last few years and what are, what are the benefits that you got uh, from reduction in terms of, can you quantify those? See, basically what has happened, Krishan, I firstly, uh, good to hear from you. Secondly, very good question. See, what we've done over the last two years is we have virtually taken the salesman out of the equation as far as inventory is concerned. Today, across Pidilite's division, 80% and therefore pretty much all of the major distributors are on a replenishment model which therefore means that no salesman takes orders. The concept of, you know, month end or, you know, period end, uh, stocking up, etc. is all, you know, uh, something of the past. Everything is based on replenishment. Salesmen don't take orders. Dealers can order directly, which goes via the distributor. So we've now, in a sense, we, and, you know, while obviously during COVID in some cases, we actually built up inventory because of the supply chain shortages, plants being closed in certain affected areas, so on and so forth. And, you know, given normally that uh, April, June tends to be a big period for us, especially in the areas of waterproofing, etc., what we build up a little inventory. But the dealer pipeline, frankly, over the last 24 months is now firmly in our control and not an issue of concern at all for us. Very, I mean, it's not something where I would say, hey, listen, major reduction has happened because we've actually made this reduction now over a number of years. But it's, again, an area where uh, we are clear that, you know, based on, again, product, I mean, we have a fairly uh, well-defined algorithm based on the speed of the rotation of the product and how much stock a distributor carries. And that is now standard for all our divisions. Got it. Got it. Bharat, one more question. Uh, while you did indicate earlier that uh, uh, there is uh, less or lesser margin pressure compared to in the growth and pioneer categories. Uh, what about working capital? Is that uh, is that proving to be longer than you had expected in some of these categories, or they are very much in control? No, we are not finding. I mean, you know, with our retail footprint and our ability to influence in retail, we are not finding a substantial difference in working capital across the categories at all. Sure. I mean, where we find the difference, Krishnan, actually is the difference between B2C and B2B. B2B tends to have longer working capital, but that's always been the case. That's not something new. Got it. Got it. And uh, staying on working capital, Bharat, anything to call out on the international business? Uh, is that uh, I mean, anything unusual? See, I mean, the, right now, of course, the issue of concern, of course, it's not big for us. It's fairly small, but it's still an issue of concern is the closure, closure in Sri Lanka. We were actually doing quite well in Sri Lanka over the last 24 months. Bangladesh has been a massive success story for us. You can see the numbers and you can see that Bangladesh is, you know, virtually becoming uh, another West Bengal for us, which is very good. Overall, you can see that what we have done, you know, and we had talked about this a number of years ago, that we are going to be an emerging market specialist and we will keep gaining in emerging markets. And you can now see that all of our international operations our profit making, our operations that are now, you know, in in a sense synergistic with what we do and are doing fairly well. So, you know, today over a thousand crores of our sales comes out of exports plus international and it's growing at a steady rate. It is there, there are no sudden ups and downs. And that's a matter of, you know, a fair amount of quiet pride for us. Okay, and nothing nothing to call out on working capital in this any any No, no issues no issues on working capital, absolutely. Very clear. Thanks, Bharat. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jai Kumar Doshi from Kota. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about, you know, you mentioned that every quarter there will be an innovation from Pedilite. So, you know, are you referring to some big bang innovations that likes of is there even an opportunity to you know uh, on in the core fevicol portfolio the way we used, we had seen in the past marine then hyper heat x so is there an opportunity of innovation on that front or uh, you know you're re referring more uh, towards you know innovations within the construction chemicals portfolio such as tiles adhesives and other such uh, products thanks jay i think that's a great question 
I must tell you unequivocally, we are referring to innovation both on the core as well as the growth categories. And just as in the past, we've done the marine hypers and heat exes. Now, obviously, for confidentiality reasons, I can't tell you what you will see coming because that will, you know, give a red flag to my competition. But you will see innovations across both our core as well as our uh, growth categories. And you will see a lot of these, obviously, we are looking at have to be, you know, innovations that move the needle for us. At an organization level, you know, we the numbers that we set for ourselves is that one third of our growth must come out of innovation. And we are well on our way to now, you know, we've got the pipeline ready to do that. Uh, understood. And this, uh, we'll start seeing from uh, FI23, I mean, the next one or two quarters? Or still, uh, you, you will start seeing from ex the second quarter of this year itself. Uh, right. Uh, second is, see, uh, I understand that, you know, you are catering to a different market uh, when we think about waterproofing and paint companies are catering to a different market. But when I, whenever, you know, when we compare the numbers, I think, you know, in scale terms, uh, that, you know, that value added quotes, uh, waterproofing, it's waterproofing functionality has probably exceeded, uh, you know, uh, the waterproofing portfolio that you have. Now we are seeing similar trends in adhesives as well. I believe that you know paint companies are very aggressively selling low-priced tile adhesives. Uh, you know that's that's a category that is growing very well for you. But I, I'm, my understanding is you're not participating in that commoditized tile adhesive product. So from a long-term perspective, you know how do you think about you know the aspect that you know paint companies have always focused on mass, economy, scale, volumes. And you, as an organization, have always focused on high-margin niche businesses, but they are entering some of your core categories uh, or future growth categories, uh, you know, through that mass and volume game. So, how do you how do you sort of think about that, you know, new competition in in construction chemicals and waterproofing, where until maybe three years back we thought that you know it's pretty light and some of the international players. Now it's pretty light paint companies and of course the international players. Again, great question, Jay. Let me answer the question in three parts. First, as far as waterproofing is concerned, frankly, the paint companies have just redefined their definition of waterproofing and added exterior paints and so on and so forth, which were coatings which, you know, I mean, just as an anecdote, as a young marketing manager, I launched Apex in Asian Paints about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. We never saw it as a waterproofing product, right? So now to right. put it as part of your waterproofing portfolio, I mean, that's a choice that you make. If you look at pure waterproofing, we, we have always maintained that there is a right for paint companies to play in the repair and renovation segment because in India, given the quality of construction, Consumers tend to repair, renovate, and waterproof because there, there are leakages. Rest of the world, repair and renovation is, you know, one-third of the business, two-thirds is new construction. In India, it's pretty much, you know, the other way around, though now new construction is gaining. In new construction, the paint companies tend to play much, much lesser because, you know, in new construction, the consumer actually ends up at the steel and cement outlet and not at the paint outlet. Paint comes only when, you know, and you have to do waterproofing when you're constructing, not after construction is complete. Now, therefore, when I look at the overall segment, frankly, I don't see any gaps in our portfolio. Yes, now a choice of whether we should play more aggressively in what we call paints rather than waterproof coatings is a choice we have to make, which we have up to now said that, listen, we still believe there is a massive market for us to address in terms of, you know, non-competition and converting people to using waterproofing. And that's where our focus has been. Paint companies have tended to, rise, uh, to ride on our coattails and, you know, try and then look at how can they get a share of that. Therefore, if you look at the institutional market, you look at the large market, the competition is still, frankly, the large, you know, multinationals and us, the paint companies largely don't play it now. They would like to play there, but currently they don't. Similarly, if you look at areas like adhesives, in tile adhesives, see, the bottom end of the market is purely commoditized. It's like, you know, what, if I was to give you a paint analogy, it is it was what dry distemper used to exist 
you know, 30 years or 35 years ago, and slowly people went to oil bound and then acrylic mist temples and then emulsion. Our, we have basic tile adhesives too, but we believe. We begin at a level where we believe that there's a certain minimum quality that must be offered. And frankly, when I look at my growths in both waterproofing and tile adhesives, without any doubt, we are gaining. We are not losing in any way. So I think these are strategic choices that companies make. In the short run, it, you know, the volumes look good. If I mean, you know, if I was to actually add back my tile adhesive volumes and you know equate the kilos of tile adhesives to the kilos of white glue that I do, my actually volume growth rates will go up by 10 or 12 percent. But frankly, I think that is, in a sense, doing a disservice to you people and to ourselves. So we don't do it that way. Understood. One final question, you know, now Huntsman portfolio seems to have stabilized around quarterly run rate of 140-150 crore, which is about 50% higher than what, uh, you know, uh, at the time when you acquired it. Uh, so is the entire distribution benefit captured or uh, is there any low-hanging fruit as far as distribution and top line is concerned for Huntsman? There is definitely a low-hanging fruit and a distribution runway yet. We are still, I would say, only two-thirds of the way there. There is still one-third of it still has to be captured. For a, You know, while Araldite is a leader, in my book, it is still a growth category, and you will see in the results, hopefully, in the next 12 months, that we're not going to come back to, you know, saying that, hey, this is a mature category. This is a growth category. We have shown over the last two years that we've beaten the acquisition case and what we had said by a large number. But we still believe there's a lot more to go. Understood. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritesh Shah from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. A couple of questions. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, in the initial remarks, you indicated uh, volumes remain subdued on account of the pandemic and the persistent inflation. Uh, so I just wanted to understand this if you could uh, bifurcate your portfolio into two broader categories. Uh, when we say demand, is this on back of say something like price elasticity of demand uh, with the overall construction cost moving up, or is it the inflation uh, impacting uh, discretionary spends? Uh, so how should one understand this better? Again, Great question, Ritesh. To my mind, there are two different ways of looking at this. When we said, you know, demand was subdued, what tends to happen in an inflationary situation is whenever you are raising prices, the trade tends to stock up. So one quarter looks much better than the other, you know, and therefore while primary sales may not look so good, secondary sales, frankly, evens out. The second thing is in the pandemic, obviously what happens is there are closures, you know, Cities are closed in, in March, and, uh, in, sorry, in January and parts of February. We again had those, you know, you can't open on the weekend. You can only close on so-and-so times, etc. That obviously impacts work and therefore work that should get completed in one month takes three months or, you know, more to complete and that impacts the demand. The third thing is, you know, if you look at the consumer purchase basket, prices of everything, so, you know, while we are a very small part of home improvement, if a person is building a home in, say, rural India, and I was in rural UP two weeks back, and what the fellow was saying is, sir, if you look at the increase in cost of steel, cement, paint, so on, suddenly the consumer will need another 20, 25% over last year to make the same room or the make, make the same two rooms. And that obviously, therefore, like, you know, he tends to cut down, you know, because he's got a fixed, fixed income. So where we are seeing actually demand subdued, is in small town, rural, and wherever there are you know economic challenges. The rest, frankly, in our view, will even out over a period of time. Uh, sir, uh, this is quite uh, helpful. Uh, but sir, when we say uh, this is something which will even out, uh, sir, what gives us that confidence? Uh, given I think food inflation is pretty steep. Uh, the actual discretion spend uh, is actually a question. So it it will come back. Uh, but but what gives us the confidence that probably say three months, six months, uh, sir, uh, how do you understand that? See, two things. Again, I think I share your concern because, you know, having seen this earlier, whenever there have been periods of high inflation, there is an impact on volumes. And it normally starts from the bottom end and then extends. Having said that, we are, we are seeing some amount of tailwinds, you know, 
for example uh, abhi spoke about the real estate sector clearly there is a revival in the real estate sector and abhi up to now we are not seeing at least any signs of slow because suddenly you can see a slew of new projects being announced so whether it is real estate whether it's the consumer spending a lot more post the pandemic on home renovation on home upgradation and the reopening you know of the whole commercial segment be it hotels be it restaurants be it shopping uh, areas and a lot of these that were closed or were semi closed have had to renovate and open so therefore we are seeing that urban demand is uh, st- still going decently it's not you know depressed despite the kind of inflation we are seeing but i would you know to declare success frankly i would wait another 3 to 6 months before i declare success Sure, sir. Uh, so, second question uh, in the scenario that we are in, uh, what are the strategies one can actually adopt to beat uh, or or maintain margin? Uh, are there any categories that we have wherein we even have an option to reduce uh, grammage, uh, given we have a formidable large portfolio? Uh, sir, uh, if you can help me understand this a little bit. Unfortunately, you know, you are reminding me of my good old confectionery days, where every time prices went up you know i must tell you as a small anecdote when we introduced the 5 rupee cadbury dairy milk chocolate it used to be 20 grams i think it is now 5 grams or 4 grams so you can see the extent of price but unfortunately we don't have many of those because as i said if you are making a table at home or you are making a chair or you are you know making a wardrobe the amount of product that you are going to use is never in the smaller quantities where a consumer is going to like you know downgrade substantially and therefore from a price point or margin perspective really what we have to do is while remaining conservative keep making sure that we are slowly trading the customer to the newer price points to the newer prices and getting her or him used to those price points because the give the way our product is used where price points matter we are obviously keeping those price points so whether it be a fevy quick it be some of the children's art material etc the other places we have to just keep making sure that we are giving the consumer we are being conservative and not taking it up too aggressively uh, sure uh, so just uh, continuing to the same question uh, so how do you look at the margins when it comes to the influencer or uh, the distribution channel uh in in the current very inflationary scenario uh, do we even look to tweak it uh, or we just wait for uh, the demand to come and uh, hope for margin to improve with raw mat hopefully going down could you just repeat that i lost you for the last moment uh, uh, so my question is uh, how do we look at uh, the money that is put on the table for the dealer and the influencer uh, when, when the conditions are tough uh, have we tweaked those variables Uh, or do we intend to do that going forward uh see if for example as of now you know values are still actually looking good for the trade so on so forth so we've not had an occasion to tweak but whenever we do face for example like you know for example during covid when we did face obstacles with influencers etc we actually did deals with paytm and converted all of our points to money so that the person could immediately get money so we have a lot of these uh, therefore uh, Needs available to us, which we keep working the trade. But you know, I mean, when I take a step back and you look at our business growth over the last year, if your business has grown, you know, 35 percent, then the trade is not so worried about margins as long as they are seeing that you know, listen, the volumes will keep growing going forward, and therefore our objective has to be to keep focusing and making sure that we grow volume in this inflationary environment because you know, obviously, you don't want just empty price-led growth. Sorry to interrupt. May I request Mr. Ritesh to please rejoin the queue? We have participants waiting for the turn. Sure. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avi Mehta from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to understand. You highlighted that you know from a medium term, or you know even if I kind of look at beyond the quarter, demand environment has been relatively good, and the fact that pressures are primarily in core. in that sense would you argue that the gross margin has probably bottomed out uh, something that you had kind of highlighted that it will bottom out in jan feb in the last conference call as well or do you see some more near term pain 
see it's very difficult to say avi good to hear from you in fact uh, if you look at it in jan feb we thought will be you know a period where we will start seeing uh, some amount of softening and then unfortunately this whole geopolitical russia ukraine happened and you know everything turned on its head again if i look at the supply demand scenario i look at the overall scenario at some point of time it has to start evening out because you know capacities even today are far greater than demand it's just that those capacities are not being realized mm-hmm. uh, but i would say in the next 3 4 months you will still remain at elevated levels it's probably only in the second half of the year that you will start seeing some amount of uh what i would say softening and that's when like you know you would have to examine what the situation is as of now i don't see it going further i mean but you know unless there is one more black swan event but i do believe that we are at an all time high we never see raw material prices this high in some cases now you know unless there are some special exigent circumstances we do believe this is probably close to the peak if not the peak itself okay perfect so i mean um, and the commentary vice versa on margins as well right uh, that is the right way to read it then when we not reach the normalized levels but it'll take some probably a 3 6 months is what i hear you but uh, we are kind of it going depends on what you define as normalized level your range uh, okay actually what the range that you see for a bit the range could you repeat i mean just for the benefit of everyone we say on a stand alone basis we should be at between 20 to 24 and you know we went in i think close to 20 19 and a half close to that uh to my mind we will still be in this 20 to 24 range again unless there are some again circumstances that are completely out of the blue that should that will be our objective okay clear very clear and uh, just the last question is essentially from a more uh, you know medium term perspective if you were to rank categories in the pioneer segment and you know which one would you say would be the most likely to hit growth say 5 years or 3 years down the line which one would you call it out as definitely tile diesel okay perfect perfect and uh, you, um, that uh, where is the concern i mean where you were essentially arguing that the volume trajectory is something that you would still maintain commodity commoditized players are not going to be a concern as yet is what absolutely i mean you know in every market you will have people, you know uh, when you are again creating a category remember world over tiles are always put with an adhesive you use sand cement and adhesive in india 8 out of 10 are done with cement so therefore the scope is like massive across the you know across the spectrum no no perfect okay perfect you know and thanks a lot again for this and look forward to hopefully meeting in person sometime soon thanks again for the opportunity thank you ali thank you so much thank you The next question is from the line of Priyam Daga from Meeti Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for giving my question, sir. My question is regarding the VAM prices. So, can can I get any idea about the price hike that we have taken in the last quarter and uh, the inflation that we have faced percentage wise? See, as far as price hikes are concerned, you know. over the last 12 months depending again on the category we, we you know we've taken different price increases they could range from 5 to 15% uh in this quarter we've taken some pricing in some categories in may because we felt that the uh, quarter 1 which, which is the quarter 4 pricing really had was at a peak which we had not expected and therefore we needed to take price the other thing we're just closely watching this and seeing that you know what do we need to do next all right and uh, where do we see the warm prices going in the let's say in the next two quarters i i, I wish i knew my friend you know we thought 2000 dollars is the right area for warm prices but they are stubbornly at 25 26 2700 there are two major plants across the world that are closed which are declared force majeure so very i i frankly don't see it going substantially above this you know and maybe 100 dollars above this at over but we do believe that it has to soften over a period of time all right all right thank you thank you the next question is from the line of parth kishore from kpl capital please go ahead 
Yeah, hello, sir. Actually, uh, thank you for taking the question. So, actually, I see that the inventories are moved uh, by a lot this year. So, could you please explain that? Just repeat your question. You were muffled a little, my friend. Uh, sorry, sir. So, actually, I've seen that the inventories have moved up this year by around 460 crores. So, I mean, could you please explain that? I mean, why is the inventory build-up being so high? Yeah, basically, this is in preparation for, you know, our biggest quarter in the year tends to be part the April-July quarter. Last year, because of all of the issues around uh, the closures, etc., etc., so on, we basically uh, had whittled down inventory. So when you look at the comparison this year, we obviously had expecting a normal April to June, and we had built up the inventory substantially. Last year, if you remember, the whole period was massively challenged in the uh, first quarter, and therefore inventories tended to be low. So. A, it's a comparison. B, it's an expectation of a better April June. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. So it's not because I mean there's a build up in the at the company level or something like uh, build up at the dealer level or something like that. That the oh, product is not moving. When, when you will see this, when we will meet for the April June, the first quarter numbers, you will see that inventories will be back to normal. Okay, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking the question. All the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shomil Mehta from Kotak Life. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so just one question on from my side. Uh, well, whenever, you know, in the past cycles over the last 10, 15 years, whenever we see large RA inflationary and then it normalizes over a period of six to nine months, which should be the case this time around, the margin bank for us, for strong leaders like us, have pulled up so many years back. Normalized budget band used to be about 16, 20, moved up to 18, uh, 22, now about 2024. So uh, I believe uh, a part of that would be also. Be better, because, but you are not that clearly audible. Uh, is this better? Yes, please go ahead. Hello? Yeah, so I heard your question about the margin band. Continue. The participant have left the queue. We'll move to the next question, which is from the line of Rachita Maheshwari. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, my question has been answered. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tejasha from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Just one follow-up. Uh, sir, just this uh, the question is partly academic in nature, but just wanted to gain some perspective from your vast experience on how the broader industry is evolving. Uh, cement players are getting into paints, paints are getting into adhesives, uh, pipe guys are getting into adhesives and paints both. Uh, so has, has anything changed materially in terms of modes, how we used to know all this uh, in, in terms of distribution, branding advantage? that incumbents had and suddenly uh, the way capital is flowing or getting fungible between the categories it seems that some of those modes are no longer relevant so just wanted to gain uh, get your perspective on it no you know i think that's a great question i mean you know while obviously all companies will look at adjacencies it's always been the uh attempt of a large number of commodity players, whether they be cement, whether they be in you know equivalent categories, steel, etc., to try and keep moving up the value chain. In my view, Tejas, it doesn't matter whether it is paint or whether it is adhesive or whether it is, you know, pipes. Finally, the three factors that, you know, in a sense contribute to your both is the strength of your brand, the strength of your, you know, customer relationship and the strength of your user relationship. And if you are strong on all of these three, I mean, looking at other people's multiples and, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I keep hearing anecdotally that, you know, all these people look at the multiples of, you know, paint companies or companies like us and feel that, you know, if they entered our sectors, they would get the same multiples. But frankly, from a strategic perspective, I mean, you have to have a reason to win or you have to have a reason to disrupt. And the moat in terms of the strength of the brand, the strength of the customer and user relationships and your, you know, hopefully ability to service via good supply chain 
is that is strong i mean you know competition will come and go but it's not going to be easy for new players easily fair point sir that's very helpful sir thanks thank you the next question is from the line of sachi trivedi from trade and capital please go ahead Hi, Bharat. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, um, you know, you mentioned about you know your investments in technology, and now that everything is on a replenishment model. Based on that, on first of April of any year, how much of you know your demand for the year do you already know? I think that's a great question. But you see, normally we will keep. predicting and working based on you know we obviously have algorithms based on the last 3 months based on the last 1 month based on the last 6 months so we have a fair idea and then you know you would look at your secondary sales not so much your primary sales look at any one offs like for example when we will plan for this year's first quarter clearly we will look at last year's last year we had some amount of closures in may as a result of you know the wave of the pandemic you will equalize for that we will then add for innovation so on so forth or any local factors and then work that through so i i would say you have visibility hopefully at close to anywhere between 80 to 90% of your demand okay okay and the second question is in a um, sort of a similar context you talk about innovation and you know you've launched uh, very many products and some very good products you know over like over a period of time how has training you know and educating your end user been you know and how has it evolved how has the difficulty of that evolved you know over the years and particularly now with any number of you know competitors who are also trying to uh, get to the same end user so could you talk a little bit about that yeah i think again uh, absolutely relevant question in fact you know what one of the things we pride ourselves on is the strength of our user relationships and our ability to forge long term partnerships with our users which obviously therefore includes a fair amount of training a fair amount of information dissemination on a regular basis you know i mean just to give you an idea we have 220000 contractors each of whom will have you know anywhere between 5 and 50 workers or who are pretty much in touch with us at least once in a quarter dealing with us so on so forth this is frankly our bread and butter business and making sure that the user is a fully acquainted b sees our new products and c has a strong relationship with us is frankly one of the reasons of our success but has that um sort of the education and training has it become more difficult over the years um or has it become easier maybe because of technology or because of uh, i don't know do you reach them on an app do you like how do you even reach them now how do you we have do you actually we have them? apps for each of our users we reach them via apps we reach them uh, physically last year for example during covid we did over a thousand user meets on microsoft teams Now, if somebody had told me two years ago that you know carpenters will be sitting and doing meets on Teams, you would have said, "Listen, guys, are you sure this is possible?" But there has been that evolution. So we actually use digital very aggressively. We have a very, very robust database, so we are able to push information on a regular basis. Today, a large number of the contractors have smartphones, and therefore, you are able to share information. I mean, a large part of our digital effort is really around the user and the dealer. got it got it okay and uh, one um, we talked a lot about adjacencies and particularly you know your competitors moving into adjacent spaces um we are, and as an example of a paints company here uh, they are now also moving into let's say home decor and you know doing some of the painting themselves in your case you did take some stride and you know you took a stake in pepper fry is that an area where you feel the need to enter you know sort of building your furniture See, we have, we don't want to compete with our customers, so we don't want to build furniture. But as the digital world changes, we definitely want to understand and remain close to the consumer. So we have investments in Pepper Fry, we have investments in Home Lane, we have investments in Live Space. 
we do that on a regular basis largely to make sure that we are completely on the ground floor as far as the new age consumer is concerned and we are our business is getting oriented towards being able to serve the customer in today's environment but we don't see ourselves as competitors to you know our customers in making furniture etc got it got it and just one final question from me what is it that you worry about and what is the data points that you are looking at on a daily basis or a weekly basis uh, the macro data points or um, uh, even external you know sort of uh, foreign data points or domestic data points and what are the data points you're looking at and what do you worry about the most right now i would say that's a great question I, two data points and one softer point just to keep it simple the two data points that i constantly worry about is a first and foremost the price of oil because everything in our category starts from the price of oil and you know i think there's enough data now also in the indian economy to show that 